uh, the code of conduct stuff and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. let me get, get let's, let's go ahead and get started yeah, yeah. here. All right, so a few a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. Sorry, uh, but there is a Q and A box if you have questions. Uh, we'll also be monitoring the chat as well. Um, if you uh, need, you know, anything from us, let us know in chat or you know DM, you know, send us a private message. This is an official CNCF webinar. Uh, as such, it is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not do or say or chat or question anything that would be in violation of the Code of Conduct. Basically, be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Uh, please note the recording and slides. There are no slides, so the recording will be posted later today, probably tomorrow, uh, to the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. I'd like to also mention we just created the uh, streaming channel in the CNCF Slack. So go to cncf.slack.io if you're not already a member. Join that channel. We will be sharing tips and tricks there as time goes on. There is also a doc that will be shared in chat that is kind of like this OBR or OBS webinar uh, thingy. So with that, I just pasted and, it in. <laughs> thank you, George. With that, I'll hand it over to George to kick off today's presentation. Take it away, George. Awesome. So let me give you all the logistics first. So uh, in this, I just uh, tossed this link hack.md or hackmd.io with the OBS webinar. Uh, those are basically going to be our notes. Um, so we want information. So when we get to hardware recommendations or whatever, if you have anything, I know Spencer's been putting information in there. I get the feeling that eventually we are going to commit this to GitHub somewhere as be kind of like a general resource. So this is a good place to start as well as we have the hash streaming channel on CNCF. So I'm just going to give you a quick TLDR on why we're doing this. So I was hanging out last Friday with Chris Anacek, just talking about different things. And we were talking about, I was like, man, I'm really busy this week. It feels that with um, what's going on in the world. A lot of people have been reaching out to me saying, Hey, I need tips on how to use this software. I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, or, you know, I'm an expert, but there's always something you can learn in a lot of ways. The things you're going to learn today are like Linux. Like you'll spend your whole adult life learning OBS and not know everything. Um, so in my brain, I was thinking, you know, I know a lot of great streamers in the open source community, right? Um, my coworkers at TGIK and the Podlets, um, Lockie's channel. I've, you know, I've watched, I've watched Holden's Twitch stream. I watched Spencer's Twitch stream. And I was like, you know what? Wouldn't it be great if we just had a place where we could hang out and swap tips? We see each other at KubeCon, but we don't really like sit down and say, you know what? How do I make my audio better or do a little thing? And as this has been happening in the world, I'm starting to come to realize that for a lot of us, these skills are becoming pretty much commonplace. And if you follow how gamers, uh, gaming streams and things like that, there's this whole world of community interaction that's happening online around streaming your favorite video game, uh, whatever it is. And I was like, you know what, that's the kind of stuff where like, uh, you know, open, having open source people having these same kind of using these tools in the same kind of manner almost feels like soon is going to be a regular thing as opposed to, oh, neat, your open source project is cool. It has mailing lists. It has, you know, and then there's a bonus. Oh, neat. They have a stream. I get the feeling that in the next few years, as people are looking at open source projects and things like that, they're going to see things like a stream or an office hours or something like that be as common as a mailing list or something like that. So this is very much the beginning of that organization. Um, in hindsight, I kind of wish I would have made this a panel so we are all talking and discussing. So what we're gonna do here is get an intro, understand what your requirements are, what you need. So in a lot of ways, we're gonna be covering some things that I think might be beginner uh, for some of you and some might not, but for me, I determine success is, are we gonna start hanging out into streaming? Are we gonna start to basically form a little community so that when someone is being told, hey, DevRel person or community manager, guess what? Streaming is expected of you now. They kind of have us here um, to do that. So that's kind of like the, the reason I wanted to do this um, and why I've invited a lot of you, even though you're experienced already, um, to kind of just let you know that, you know, this, this could be a good idea. So. Um, what does everybody think? Feel free to type that in Slack or with that. Um, and I, I've been leveraging Alex for years. Hey, what kind of microphone do I buy? How do I set this up? And he's been giving me a lot of recommendations that I've been sharing with a lot of people. Um, but I really just wanted to get a baseline down from a person who actually knows audio engineer professionally uh, to help us apply that to kind of like what we're doing on the side. 
So with that, I'd, I'd like to thank you all for showing up as well. Um, and with that, let's get our learn on. If um, at the end, if people don't have any places to go, we can always fire up another Zoom meeting, uh, just a normal one. We can hop on there and swap tips. Um, so basically we can make this whatever we want to be. I am talking way too long. And with that, Alex, go. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, George. We just ran this thing out another extra minute, eight, extra eight <laughs> minutes long. Yeah, all, all my time codes now are off. Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. So we are going to time box certain things because I don't want to talk about microphones for like two hours. So uh, we Aww. definitely want to those of you as you're listening, please tell us if you need us to talk about other things or if we're daddling too long. Yeah, um, if there's so certain topics you need to hear about, let us know in the chat, please. Yep. And uh, Spencer, that's hash streaming on slack.cncf.io. And I see people joining us there. Thank you. All right, Alex, take it away. All right. Well, thank you, George, for the wonderful introduction. I appreciate going through all the little stuff here. Um, I kind of really want to open with, you know, you sort of touched on who the, the attendees are here, and there's kind of a mix of pro versus not so pro. Um, first thing out of the way, I am not a professional sound engineer. Uh, I've been paid to do sound engineering, so I guess that makes me a pro. Um, but I highly recommend finding a local audio professional if you have some more in-depth stuff about this because, you know, find a local buddy who actually does this stuff day in and day out. They can actually give you some really nice tips that we might not know because um, this is a very wide and deep subject. I could talk about audio stuff for days uh, and not even scratch the surface. So, um, George, I guess we're going to presume these are going to be mostly people who are doing this on the regular, um, have a bit of a budget, and are going to be you know, pretty much doing this at least monthly, if not weekly. Is that a good assumption? Yeah, looking at the chat, it looks like, so I know some of the people here do have regular shows. I know Carlisi and Duffy do. Mm -hmm. um, Spencer obviously does. Um, Justin says, I'm more interested in the OBS restreaming platforms uh, mm -hmm. than in the hardware, but keep it up. I'm here to learn. Okay. Um, and I know, Chris, you've been doing some stuff around Red Hat streaming. Yeah, we're mm -hmm. doing a lot of OBS and twitching. Yep, and it looks like Stacy's a beginner. Yeah, so let's just start. And then I think, you know, we've got some time boxes there in the notes. And as we go, mm -hmm. if we find ourselves rabbit holing too much, we'll, we'll move on. Um, Perfect. And awesome. then I will, I'll be on chat helping people join Slack here in a sec. Perfect. Well, I guess the big thing here is then uh, first two questions are, well, there's only really one question here. What's your budget? Um, we were talking before the show went up here and there is, you can get things going on a very, very shoestring budget, or you can make a, you can dig a big money hole and throw money into it. Uh, really depends on how much you want to do. Uh, so starting up for all technical people here, um, we've been involved in open source, you know, I'm assuming most of you have actually been do doing some code work or at least, you know, computer competency, delegate out your task. You're not in this alone. Uh, like George said, we have the streaming channel. Uh, we'll be in there keeping things going back in there in conversation. If you have questions, ask. Um, if you wanna try something, ask. People have experiences here. Uh, there has been so many times where I wish I had someone else just to bounce questions off of, where I wanna try this new setup with a microphone. Can someone spot check me? I wanna check out this new video camera. Has anyone tried it? You know, Open up communication, ask questions. Uh, I've had many a times where someone's came to me and asked me about the certain, you know, certain piece of hardware. And it's like, I don't know, but I think I might know someone who does. And you, know, you start the phone tree up or the email tree or the IRC tree or the Slack tree or, you know, whatever the cool kids are doing now. And someone will find out. Um, and if they can't find out, well, maybe I'll just be suckered into buying it myself and giving it a try. <laughs> like this pre app I bought yesterday. <laughs> So yeah, um, second step, safety first. Um, and we didn't really do the, uh, the intro here, but my history here has been in system administration as well as scuba diving. Uh, and both of those have a very long history of checklist and safety. Um, in system administration, you know, you, you don't cross your T's and dot your I's, you got server downtime and you got your boss yelling at you. In, in diving, if you don't cross your T's and dot your I's, well, it's a little bit worse. So safety first. Uh, we're going to be bringing in a lot of equipment, um, depending on how big you go in here. Uh, you got 
computer rigs, you've got monitors, you've got lighting, you've got microphone rigs. Uh, some of this stuff doesn't have power switches. A lot of professional audio gear does not shut off uh, when it's powered up. Uh, it's very rare, but know your exits. Have a fire extinguisher. Uh, know how to shut your power off. Um, for me, that's going downstairs and flipping the third breaker on my panel to shut my office down. Uh, my closest fire extinguisher is out in the hallway. Know your fire extinguishers, know how to shut things down. Uh, hopefully you'll never have to do that, but if you do, it's nice to know. <laughs> uh, modern podcasting is a little bit better than it used to be. Uh, if you go back about 20 years uh, before LED panels were kind of the convention, uh, it was pretty easy to rack up a, a kilowatt or two kilowatts of lighting. Uh, that is a lot of power. Um, usually you're talking dedicated circuits and dedicated heat extractors. Uh, modern stuff, you know, you get those foot by, you know, one foot by one foot LED panels. I think they're, George, you got one of those, what are they, like 15 watt, 10 watt maybe? It, it's nothing. Um, modern stuff is, is a lot more power efficient. It runs a whole lot cooler. Um, so you could probably get away with running a pair of lighting panels, a camera, desktop, a couple monitors, a good microphone setup on a single 20 amp circuit. Uh, you might get a little bit iffy. Oh, there, there you go, George. What is it? He doesn't have a headset on. <laughs> so usually a 20 amp home circuits fine. Uh, a lot of modern houses have 15 amp circuits. You might, it might be pushing it. What was it, George? Five amp, five watt, ten watt. I got a, I got eleven. You got eleven. It, it doesn't a little... say. There's like a brick. I'm, I'm still learning. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, that's less than an amp on the mains. Eh, you know, that's that's nothing. So, yeah, LED lighting has has changed things considerably. Uh, having said that, you still might have cooling problems. Um, heat's the enemy here. No matter what you do, heat is going to be a problem. Uh, and if you throw some fans at the problem, you're going to have sound problems. So good luck and Godspeed on that. <laughs> yeah, Duffy has our first question. Um, sure. Any concern here with modern equipment and things like line noise and a like whiny kind of thing going through your mics? Um, I've not had trouble with ground loops on balanced equipment, you know, professional XLR stuff. Uh, you get into the ground hum a lot of times when you have like multiple panels and multiple mixers running on separate circuits that are like slightly out of phase on the mains power. Um, and I, honestly, I haven't ran into a situation where it was a ground loop on a rig in many years. Uh, that was a constant problem on doing on-site uh, shoots where we had um, multiple power generators running in multiple grids. And our, our sub panel would have a ground loop going back to the main panel. And for that, all we had to do was just cut one of the grounds and, you know, run a main, run a main ground, a chassis ground out, and then lift the grounds on the signals. So I don't think anything that we're doing in this context is going to be big enough where you're going to have a situation where a ground loop is going to be a problem. Uh, mm. That doesn't say that can't happen, um, but clean power is good power. Uh, I run UPSs on everything uh, that have, uh, what's the term for it? It's not a, a droop protection or is it line clean conditioning? Signal? That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Full line conditioning on the UPSs and it's never been a problem. Thank you, Bob. Active line filtering. That's it. <laughs> so, and, and we can get into stuff like power factors and no. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's just move on to audio <laughs> hardware and just start to get to the meat here. Yep. Yep. Perfect. So, Big choice up front, um, USB or Pro. That's going to be, for the most people here, I, I figure we're going to go Pro. Uh, if you have very little space, if you have a very small desk, if you're doing stuff where you need to be mobile, if you're going to shoot on location, uh, look at USB. Um, for many years, I ran just a USB interface. Uh, it's an X2U just a USB interface. And I'm like, that's it. Um, there's stuff like the, uh, which one is, we were talking about this earlier, the, the AT2020, Audio-Technica. Beautiful Yeah, mic. that's a microphone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. USB, uh, all integrated. Uh, 
the Pro, or I think it's the AT2020 Plus has a zero latency line monitor on it. So you can self monitor what you're, how you're sounding going out and mix with your mix master. Um, any kind of USB mic you're looking at, I highly, highly recommend getting the monitor option if it's, if it's available. Um, I know so, the- So what does the word monitor mean in yeah, this context? to find that for people. Yeah. Okay, so a monitor is just a loopback. You know, I have, in my audio chain here, I have the microphone here, which has a preamp. We're getting that, going that bit. That then runs into a signal. Um, it's a DBX286S. And then I run it into my interface, which is that X2U Sure. Now, Normally, when you're listening to a recording, you'll go, you know, all through your audio chain, hit the analog digital converter, the interface. Uh, that then goes into your computer. Magic happens in the computer. And then that comes out of your computer monitor. Now, while that latency is a couple milliseconds, what's the USB polling interface is like five milliseconds. And, you know, it might be another 10 on top of that for your software chain. Um, that's not that much but it can change things. So what a mic monitor does is it gives you directly what is going into the interface. Uh, not what's coming out, not what's being tweaked by your EQs or anything like that. It's straight what's coming in. Um, so in my, I have, I have monitor earphones on right now as well. So I'm hearing my voice directly with effectively zero latency. Um, if you go back and forth between the computer, you can, it, it's generally not that bad, but it's just enough latency that it drives me up the wall. <laughs> so, so having an actual loopback monitor so you can self-check things um, is, I think, an essential piece of podcasting equipment. Yeah, it just makes it really nice to naturally monitor your voice without having that slight mm -hmm. delay. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, having it on right now lets me know that I sound okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Carlisa, can we get an example of that gear? So the, the options that you put in as far as the microphones and stuff, um, I'm assuming most of them have a monitoring option or... So um, th now, now I'm going completely off script here. <laughs> let's do it. Uh, th this is my XTU interface here. Here's my headphone monitor out. This is my USB out going to the computer. Oh, this is awkward. <laughs> um, and then this is my out from my processor over here. So I can adjust my mix between what you guys are saying. Like now I don't even hear myself or I can just listen to myself. I don't want to hear what, you're, what you guys are saying. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just got this in a couple days ago, so I don't have a rack mount unit for it or anything like that yet. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to gear, I don't know. It's one of those things, just, you know, use what works. If it's, what's the saying I always say, um, if it's dumb and it works, it's not dumb. <laughs> yeah. So generally speaking, as long as you have a direct monitor thing and, mm -hmm. and the things that we've recommended here in this have that, right? Say again? Yeah. The, the recommendations that you put in the document have that, right? So. Yes. Yes. All the interfaces okay. have yeah. the loopback monitor and, the recommended models on the Blue Yeti and the Audio Technica also have the loopback. Okay, good to know. Um, related mm -hmm. question here from Duffy's asking, um, also dynamic versus condenser microphone. What are the trade-offs? Mm -hmm. I've seen dynamic pick up way too much personally. All right, I, I love when people ask questions that are right into the next segment. It keeps things moving. <laughs> That's right, yeah. So the difference between a dynamic and a condenser mic is that I mean, it's really kind of the same thing. You know, it, you have a diaphragm and then you have a signal that comes out of it. Uh, with a dynamic mic, that is through a voice coil. It's basically a speaker in reverse. Uh, a condenser mic, and this, this is something I'm gonna get wrong because it's, it's weird. Uh, they use the capacitance of a charged plate versus a, an anoid, cathoid. Um, ba basically, it's instead of detecting the movement of a coil through a magnetic field, a condenser mic has a induced current through the plate gap, and then the actual vibration causes magic. <laughs> yeah, or you could just tell us what the properties are of each, and I don't need to know exactly it's, how it works. The, the condenser mics <laughs> generally have a, a lighter, um, I'm, I'm looking for the term here, diaphragm. 
they have a lighter mm. flying weight or flying piece. Um, so the condenser mics, they have the, the coil wrapped around it and, or the, the dynamic mics have a coil and a magnet and a condenser mic has just a plate and a grid. And the, generally speaking, your, your big broad strokes is dynamic mics are gonna be a little bit more robust. Um, I have, personally, I've seen this thing, it's got dents in it and just, I've taken Sure SM58 dynamic microns and beaten nails with them and they still work. <laughs> The, the SM58 is a well-known just tank of a microphone. <laughs> um, and, anytime... and I'm definitely saying, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, is a condenser also a smaller cone through which we're receiving? Because I know my Blue Yeti, I had to talk across it. And then that's when you recommended this mic, I have to talk into it. Yep. The, so the Blue Yeti. Those is, are is clearly a... one, is, one is one and one is the other kind, right? The, the Blue Yeti is its own particular thing because it's a, I believe it's a multi-element condenser mic. And so you can adjust the pickups on it. Like I yes. know you can do like a, a cardioid and then yeah. you can do an Omni and then you got a, a buy. Um, no, Chris is gonna go fetch his, isn't he? Yep. There All right, is. Chris. Hey, Chris. <clears throat> yeah, so there's four settings on it. I don't know what they mean, but here, I'll just show them to you and Alex, you can yeah. explain them. Those, those of you that are using this one, here's a tip read the manual that comes with it because right. for my first few sessions, I had it picking up everything 360 and it actually has a mode just to pick up the front just to pick up what's or the, the back or both or things yeah. like that. Yeah. Side by side, front, and then all around. Mm -hmm. And that works great from all I've heard. Um, yeah, I used to use this all the time. Mm -hmm. I, for me personally, anything that's magic like that, I, I don't trust. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but from what I've heard, it, it does work really well, especially for the price point. The price point of the Blue Yeti is really hard to beat. Yeah, I, that's what a... I started with. Yeah, yeah I, I always say, you know, if if you're starting out, the Blue Yeti is like a good choice, and mm -hmm. then at some point you'll realize when you want to switch XLR, you'll have the expertise. Um, I don't want to take up too much time on microphones because I kind of nope. have time. Does anybody else have questions on microphones? Because we are moving on to. Uh, do you have any opinions on lav mics before we move on away from microphones? Because I, I, I wanted to touch on lav mics before we move forward. Yeah, so um, what's a lav mic real quick, TLDR? So I never ask me to pronounce stuff because I'm going to do it wrong. <laughs> oh, God. It's like lavalier or something like that. It's lavalier. Yeah, Thank I you. Yeah, okay, yeah, right. I got you. All right. <laughs> um, so, so lav mics are those ones you see pinned onto someone's shirt. And those are particularly great for when you're trying to look good. Um, any kind of talking heads, uh, newscast, um, anything where you're standing around, you're going to use a lav mic. They work well for what they do, um, but for doing a podcast or just talking in general, I don't like them. Uh, they pick up any sort of motion on the clothing. Uh, you can rig them, you, you tie them off, and then you tape. You can tape the, the wire down a little bit better. But if your talent, or if you're the talent, uh, if you don't have good mic control, you're going to hear just the entire time it's going to be like this. Um, so use them if you need them. I don't think that are a general use case. Uh, mm -hmm. Same thing goes for shotgun mics. Ellen was bringing that up. Uh, if you have a quiet set and a nicely dampened set, shotgun mics could be a good option. Um, Traditionally, in like a, a tech podcast, you have a hard desk, you have a hard monitor. Um, the shotgun mics, in my experience, pick up a lot more room echo just from how direct their, their pickup pattern is. Um, you'll see on stuff like Tiny Desk Concerts, they use uh, shotgun mics for their primary vocals, and it sounds amazing. Uh, but they have that set up in the same way we have our microphone set up. It's just like this, but it's a shotgun mic shooting up straight to the mm. mouth. Um, mm. Works so great. That, that helps segue us into mic placement, actually, mm -hmm. which is our next, our next subject here. I know I do yep. want to cover the top down versus bottom up at one point as well. Yep. Um, a lot of people top mic. Uh, top mic is when you come in from the top. Mm -hmm. um, it prevents picking up the, any kind of pop coming off your, any pops coming off your mouth there. Uh, that's the main benefit. It comes out of the, the shot is great for that. Uh, 
The downside for technical people who are doing technical podcasts is it's going to pick up every single switch on your keyboard. Mm -hmm. Every single one. Um, was it, oh, who, who, who taught mics with an SN58? But there's one streamer, one of the tech streamers. Um, I think Gamers Nexus does it, I think. Or he switched to a, an actual traditional. He might have he used to do it that way. Um, don't but anyway. That though. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's a top mic. Um, you can do it if you're stuck on it, but it's going to, if you have a mechanical keyboard, don't even try it. It's not going to work. Yeah. For, yeah. Um, as yeah, you can I see, feel all like three for a lot here. of yeah, I started right. off top miking, and then you were the one to flip it over, and that totally made a huge difference, especially mm -hmm. when we get to noise cancellation. So, yep. um, yeah. Yeah, I like bottom miking it. Um, long arm stand. This is pretty easy to adjust around. They stay in put. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can see, all three of us here are bottom miked with a close mic SM7. Mm -hmm. um, one thing you got to watch out from this, and, and Chris, you can probably illustrate this a little bit better than I can, is the... Uh, close range effect as you get closer to the mic you get the nice bass pickup from your voice hello everyone how are you today <laughs> um which makes Versus you sound really me. good <laughs> um but the problem with that is is if you're talking for a long period of time and you have that bass it really gets tiring to listeners ears having that extra energy in the vocals it sounds so good <laughs> but just as right off the crank when I'm messing with microphones like on someone talking over, I'll immediately take off six to 10 dB off at 80 Hertz, just right off the bottom, take it out. Yeah, and Angie's asked, does side mic help here? Because I've seen people going like this, like on ESPN. Side miking does help considerably, but the problem with that is you get that room echo. So if so you're like, like So side miking right now, there's an echo? No, sorry. Um, I, I side mic by looking forward. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so yeah, that'd be. But different. yeah, if you're doing it this way, yeah. it, it just changes it, and I can hear the echo in the room for me this way. Mm. Okay. You can probably hear it too. Yeah, and Duffy says that one's also tough because you turn away from it, right? Whereas if it's bottom mic and centered right underneath, mm -hmm. you can yeah. typically. And a tip someone gave me as well is when you're wearing a black shirt. It totally helps hide the mic as well, so it kind of yes. helps That's with the presentation a little bit. Throw on a hoodie or yeah. something. Yeah. Yep. Okay, and moving the, moving on because this list is large, and I'm oh, seeing the time. Sorry. Well, if, actually, if you actually, all feel we we're, on, we're, uh, we're before we move off from side fast. miking, um, the one gotcha there where side miking does help considerably is if you don't have a pop filter. These have integrated pop filters. If you have a mic that doesn't have a pop filter, no foam, no screen, it, if you get those nasty pops, side mic it. Right. So well, I didn't know this until I switched to it. The foam is actually a pop filter. Because mm -hmm. I had one of these and I was like, I don't have a pop filter. I know I need one. And then yep. no, like, yeah, this is like a pop if, filter. If you the foam. Take it off. Yeah. Mute yourself <laughs> before you do that. Do it live. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and you can actually get a bigger pop filter than these two. Yeah, it came, mine came with one. It came, I assume that's an mm -hmm. outdoor one if it's like a big puffer. Yeah, it was a thing. big puffy one. But as you can yeah. see, it's very very much just this little cone in here mm -hmm. yeah and duffy says use a clean doubled up sock if you don't have a pop filter oh yeah uh, that works too yeah yeah oh uh, mm. yeah the dead cat filters <laughs> yeah so uh this one's important because this mm -hmm. is one that you taught me let's let's talk about um push to mute push to talk here just real quickly mm -hmm. um because i'm cognizant of time audience how do you feel we moving too fast not fast enough just let us know um, uh, but you, Alex, continue while I get the feedback. Continue on. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I opened the Q on, on the fat I heads on the screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, uh, noise suppression. Uh, there's two ways yep. of going about this, and one makes me more happy than the other. Uh, the first one is through a gate. Uh, those are generally included with something called a compressor gate unit. Uh, Sometimes, depending on how nice a unit is, you also might have an expander. So what a gate does is once your voice, once your signal drops below a certain point, it drops. So I have a gate on here. And of course, everyone's being quiet now in the background, so you can't notice it. This Do you is want what, me to talk more? I can no, 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 no. Like in the background oh. here. Oh, okay. So you can kind of hear the fan running in the background, maybe, if you listen really closely. 
and then as my gait goes up, it'll go yeah. away. Yeah, you probably can't notice it here. Yeah, so Gemini's asking what brands and stuff of mics we're putting. I'm just going to go ahead and put the link to the HackMD I.O. there. Yeah. Um, and Matt, I've got yeah, the um, Amazon list. Let me grab that. Yeah, and we're going to toss that in there. And then for the, for the mute mic, I wanted to show everyone this. Yeah, the, the other option here, if you're not using a, a gate, and this is actually something different, is a, is a, it's a cough drop. Uh, a mic mute pedal is something that when you push that button that he's showing there with your foot, it shuts it down. So if you're coughing, sneezing, um, having to swallow, those things are wonderful. The, the gate will generally take care of any kind of like rustle in your clothes. Ambient noise, right? Ambient noise. Um, but a cough, you know, if you're kind of, you know, my gate's set up like this, but if I sneeze, <laughs> you're going to hear it. Uh, mm -hmm. You're going to blow right through that gate. So they don't replace each other. They augment each other. Mm. So... And someone asked about that. It's in the list. We, all three of us are running uh, Sure uh, SM7Bs uh, with uh, cloud lifters and or Fed uh, heads. heads. Yeah. I dropped um, the link to uh, the wish list that I heard, the Amazon idea list that I created, George, in the chat. Yeah. And, and one of the things I want to add, because I re I'd added the pedal recently as well, is especially in a work from home environment, that pedal will save your life if you have a dog or in my oh. case, when a toddler decides to you know it's yeah. like an, i can ugh, right you can know you kind of save the day dm dm me that link and i'll add it to this list yeah i'll definitely add that there um okay so yep. gates and compressors and stuff like you're going to show us some of this stuff in obs so i don't want to i don't want to talk let's just talk about interfaces real quick and then maybe room prep and then yeah, get on to yeah. the video stuff with the webcamming and whatnot how does so that sound with a Audience. with a usb mic there is no interface that's turnkey plug it in rock and roll mm -hmm. um and then with, with a pro interface, with an XL interface, you can run all this signal chain and then you have to get into your computer somehow. And that's when you get into what's called the interface. Um, old schools guys will call them ADCs, audio digital converters. Um, some people call them DACs, even though it's both. <laughs> um, so interface. Uh, these are gonna be anywhere from, uh, I think the smallest ones start about $60 and you can go up to thousands of dollars. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a couple main ones that are, are pretty pretty unique and ubiquitous. That's the, the uh, Scarlet 2i2, which George, you have? Yeah, it's a little red box. You might've mm -hmm. seen me recommending it to people. I'm gonna toss a link in chat here. Yep. The, um, yeah, the Scarlets are nice. They, they are just workhorses. Um, I love mine, by the way. Thank you for that. Mm-hmm. I, I, the knobs on them are so chunky. <laughs> Love them. Uh, there, there's a really nice feature about the Scarlets is they have a very, very large knob. I don't know if you, either you guys can pull yours out right now, but um, they have a master gain control, and then they have channel input gain controls. And behind the gain control is an actual LED. Let me show the screen here. Oh, there you go. Look at that. Um, yeah. Those green and red behind the dials, those are your levels. Um, as you're recording, it'll be green, and I believe it goes yellow mm -hmm. and then red. Um, red's clipping. You don't want to clip. Uh, you generally want to be peeking into your yellows. Clipping's um, bad. Yeah, yeah, red's bad. Um, now, another really cool thing about this, and if you look at between the Scarlet Solo and the 2i2, and actually all the other ones as well, on the left, there's a standard XLR jack. That is what every single microphone is going to output using balanced outputs. On the 2i2, um, I don't know what the term for these jacks are. Um, I've always just called them pro plugs because uh, that's what we call them on scuba industry where you have the convertible inputs. It's just a pro plug. Uh, so that can take what's known as a, a quarter inch TRS input as well. <clears throat> Now, I can't show this here without tearing my stuff apart and going through it, but on the stage, most of your stuff is run through XLR. On the rack, once you get your signals into the rack, your, your signals are mostly passed through using TRS. Um, mm. And actually, when I set up my new audio processor here, I didn't get the adapter cable, so I had to run around Cincinnati yesterday finding a, a three-foot TRS adapter cable. <laughs> yeah, and you, uh, a common term for like those of you who know these plugs but don't know the actual engineering term is 
with the two one, you can plug in a guitar style plug, right? Mm-hmm. Like a one, what is that? One quarter inch? Like the yeah, big, quarter inch DRS. Big one. Yeah. Actually, um, so that might line. be an option there. However, you don't need this if you have a USB yep. mic, right? USB is directly to your USB plug on the computer. Yep. Yeah, so. USB eliminates everything. So if you get XLR, that's going to add more parts. USB is going to be dead simple. Yep. Mm-hmm. But and then let's talk, about, let's talk about room prep here because we're, uh, we're 40 minutes in and I do want to get into the OBS tips and, yeah. and all that stuff because uh, um, we could always uh, talk gear later. Let's just talk about room prep real quick and then we'll get to the webcams. Um, yeah. I mean, and then to the content itself. Yeah. Brian, thank you. I, I believe it is called Nutrix for the, the switchable ones. Um, mm. Rim prep, biggest thing you're going to deal with, dealing with is echo suppression. Um, throw rugs. Uh, I am very, very fond of the moving blankets from moving companies uh, just because you can launder them a little bit easier. They fold up a little bit better. Um, you can get the, you can go all out. If you're talking a lot and doing a lot of voice recording, you can get the, uh, the egg crate and the foam, foam egg crate stuff. Those work really well. They're pretty cheap. Um, if I was to set up a new basement studio this day, like if I had to set one up tomorrow, I would probably start with dropping moving blankets from the ceiling and then putting up any kind of backdrop in front of that because they'll just disappear in the back and it'll take that, that dry echo right out of it. Um, I don't have any sound dampening in here because I generally don't record or anything like that in here. <laughs> This is my home office. Um, so it's uh, hearing this echo <laughs> in my monitor is like driving up the wall right now. <laughs> nice. Because we're talking about it. It's like, oh, I uh, Yeah, I, I just put up cheap blankets, mm-hmm. you know, and I figured uh, avoid, you know, like when you move, when you buy it, you know, when you go into a house that has no furniture in it, it tends to be boomy. Mm-hmm. You know, and I just try to shove as much non reflective stuff into that room as possible, I think. Yep. At least yeah, so perspective, I we had a. Very- I have a very open, unfinished basement, and that's why there's flags. I've got old curtains around the furnace over there, right? Like, so the the quality that you get is because of the gear I have, right? Like, I've had to buy the gear to get rid of all this audio, you know, ambience, as opposed to putting up foam or walls or whatever, because it was just not cost prohibitive. Mm -hmm. Or it was cost prohibitive. You can have the most wonderful audio chain in the world the best one in the world and if your environment's noisy right it, it's not going to work also something to think about as well um your guests or if you're in a meeting and you have 20 other people the best audio is not going to you know you still have to be aggressive as far as ensuring people are muted and things like that because that's just always going to bite you anything else on audio before we move on i, I want to get to cameras here real quick um, but then I want to get into some meat of OBS itself. Um, audience, yeah, I mean, are you we, finding this useful? Any, any, is there anything that we've skipped audio-wise that you'd like us to talk about? Um, uh, the, the only other thing I got on, there on my list was there, if you're doing questions. There are oh, questions. Yeah. Um, I'm looking. If you're doing like serious, serious audio voiceover where you don't have to do video recording over it, um, one of the best ad hoc sound booths, closet. Mm all the clothing in the background deadens all the audio. Uh, you can go online and look up I, on YouTube where you get the, you can make a, an echo box, which is just a, basically a cardboard box with foam in it. And it is hard to beat that for a recording booth. Mm, yeah. I've, I've, I've recorded in uh, a, a hotel room bathroom with just a bunch of comforters and pillows and stuff around me before. If mm-hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. Mm. What's well, a good one. Yeah. Use what you got. <laughs> yeah, and James Strong is linking to some a- acoustic panel egg carton thingers. What do we call those little triangle yeah, looking things? Yeah, those yeah. are awesome, by the way. Yeah, and he's got some foam panel links there. Um, okay, let's let's go into webcams here real quick. Okay. Not that one. <laughs> Not the one that you're using right now. Yeah. No, no, I, I. <laughs> So with everyone being stuck at home, it's impossible to get an actual decent webcam now. Um, mm-hmm. I saw a Logitech 922 that was on sale for $350 yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I have a 920. Yeah, I could sell mine for 300 easy. Yeah, I have a 920. I, originally when I bought it, it's because it's a webcam, but it has double mics. So I was like, oh, cool, noise cancellation. 
Um, but it's not something I've been using as far as, you know, I'm using this actual audio, but mm -hmm. I, I feel like for a lot of these webcams, yeah. they're kind of a solved problem, right? At 1080p, right? Is, is it, and they're all it's, USB and, and generic, unless you're actually doing like the whole DSLR thing, which I don't know if that's, it's, oh, so, that's a thing people well, are doing here. That. Well, that, that's a whole other thing. So yeah. <sighs> Webcams like microphones, you're gonna you're gonna have haters and you're gonna have lovers, and mm -hmm. people are gonna love some of them and some people are gonna hate the other ones, and you're gonna ask five people and you're gonna get six answers. Mm -hmm. um, the 920 series Logitech, no hesitation. If you can find them, they rock. Um, yeah. I've used mine for years, but I disassembled it foolishly to try to hook it up to my telescope. Uh, that didn't work, by the way. You can't fit it in there, <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't get it back together. Um, Besides that, just trust your reviews on webcams. Um, the one I have right now is actually the number one recommended webcam on Amazon right now. It's the ELP industrial camera uh, mm -hmm. with the five to 50 lens. Um, it's not a webcam. It's an industrial camera. Don't get it. <laughs> yeah, that's why you look yellow. That's why he looks yellow today, everyone. Yep. Um, uh, you have something in here about white balance. And actually, when um, we started talking, talking you helped me adjust my camera because i was very purple and wasn't realizing mm -hmm. it so can you talk a little bit about about because i don't know anything about like calibrating your monitor colors or anything like that i'm i'm kind of just like I just, do my i want good aren't calibrated either that's why yeah. i don't trust it um white balance is just telling what telling the camera what's white uh, mm -hmm. it depends on your lighting your your ambient walls um like the issue here is i have two lights going on and i have off color walls so the auto white balance is just confused. Um, so when I'm actually doing like professional podcasting, like a PC perspective, uh, all of our cameras are set to manual white balance. And before the show started, everyone would hold up a piece of white paper. That's right, Bo. Um, and then you would just go through in vMix and say, this is white. This right here, it's white. Um, and you can sit here and talk about the numbers about it. Like uh, in the studio, I know we, we white balanced all the cameras to 3,800K just because that's what we were using for ambient light. Uh, mm -hmm. For the most part, if you just hit the auto white balance and you know give it a nice white uh, to balance off of, it'll work just fine. Okay. Um, and then let's see. So I, I, I feel like from watching everybody a lot of people who's on here watching their shows, I, I feel like cameras are pretty much um, set. Ryan has a link for folks that are considering going with an HDMI camera. He has an Iowa HD 100. Mm -hmm. um, so that's good. So let's get into, let's get a little bit into like the nitty gritty here. So um, if we want to have follow up things about just nothing but hardware, I think that mm -hmm. would be great. We could probably do that, but let's get a little bit into like, the general podcasting layout and things yeah. like that. I know um, in my initial ones, I tried to host and stream at the same time and that led to disaster. Um, mm -hmm. So let's, let's go through some of this, especially when you're talking about local groups. I do want to talk a little about a little bit about doing remote groups as well. I know mm -hmm. some people have told me that they're very interested in that. And then we can get into some of the more OBSy things. Um, how does that sound for everybody? Um, that sounds good to me. Uh, I did want to touch on before we move on to that. Uh, if you are looking at doing a, a standalone video camera or DSLR for your main camera, uh, what you're looking for online is something called clean HDMI. Um, and then also some cameras, notably Canons, uh, tend to not like being ran for a long time. Uh, personally, I use the GH5 series. I believe it was a Panasonic. And I've left those things run for days and they're fine. Um, my Canon, you let it run for 30 minutes and it's just all sorts of noisy. Okay. So, so just don't assume a camera can run all day if it's not designed to be a webcam. Wow. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know that. I just, just yeah. I didn't either. No, I've, yeah. I've been a Canon guy forever. So I, that's, yeah. I, I love my Canon cameras, but I wouldn't use them for podcasting. Um, Interesting. There's just better options out there for it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and, they fall asleep. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes they go to, uh, yeah, yeah, got it. <laughs> so, all right. All right. So, anyway. so, yeah, so general podcast layout here we have in the notes here. Let's talk about single hot seats and having how we actually do that. Mm -hmm. And then James has been mentioning noise gates and OBS, which I specifically wrote down that I do want to cover um, because, yeah, I, like, 
Yes. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> We've been wanting to do that a long time. So let's <laughs> keep going. All yeah. right. So, yeah. So, yeah. Um, I mean, you, you got a couple options here. You got the single hot seat, which is basically what we're doing. Well, we're kind of doing a remote group right now. Um, mm-hmm. Single hot seat's probably going to be what most people are doing in and out throughout here. Um, that's like your, your standard tech demos, uh, going through any tutorial videos, um, you know, documentation videos, as much as I despise them. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm totally a text documentation guy. I don't want to watch a video to, re- to learn how to do something. Um, right. That's, I mean, that's pretty much let, set it up, rock and roll. Um, you know, you can do your standard streamer setup where you have your screen share and then you're down in the bottom corner there and it's pretty much just run it. There's, there's mm-hmm. no gotchas there. Um, after that, you're talking local group, local group settings. Um, that's going to be kind of rare right now with all the quarantine stuff going on. Um, really the biggest issues in a local group setting is miking by far. Um, we always use the lav mics for the group. Like when we're doing interviews, like when uh, AMD came down, they use lav mics there. Uh, the problem is when you got two people and if they're talking forward, it's fine, but if they turn towards each other when they're talking, they talk into each other's microphones. Right. And, and right. you get this weird phasing effect. Um, that was not, that was a problem I never could get fixed. Um, and it was just a, you know, you, you can't, if people who don't sit in front of a camera and talk in front of a microphone all day are not going to understand mic control. Um, so you just got to, you just got to prevent them from being able to shoot themselves in the foot. Mm, okay. So, so let's talk more freeform remote and directed remote here because, you know, it's not freeform like we're interviewing groups currently. <laughs> yeah. Freeform remote is situation. what we're doing now. I, this is just okay. a bunch of guys sitting around chit chatting. Um, for the most part, you know, this is going to be on zoom and it's going to be a just freeform discussion. Uh, things to be concerned about here are going to be latency. I mean, it, no matter what you do, you're going to have telephone latency. And we, we've had a couple of cases actually on this, this webinar right now where we started to talk over each other. Mm-hmm. And that is something you have to be very, very cognizant of. Um, it, it's really easy, especially when you have higher latencies um, with directed remotes where some people, you know, if you have two remotes that are coming into a central location, a studio, um, and each one's 500 milliseconds, person A, it's 500 milliseconds to the studio, and then it's another 500 milliseconds to, to person B, and they're not going to hear it for a full second, and it's going to take their brain 500 milliseconds to realize, oh, I'm talking over them. Yeah. So you got two and a half seconds of just yeah. talk over. Um, yeah. Chris, you raised your hand. You something wanted I've to noticed. jump in something? Very sp- yeah. Yeah, something I've noticed very specifically is when I'm in a meeting with this mic and this audio setup versus everyone else with whatever they're using, kind of their cra- not crappy USB, but some of them are using like AirPods, which introduce even more latency, or, you know, just a standard even wired uh, ear pod, you know, the stock thing. Like I have much faster latency than they do, and I can easily talk over any of them. Mm-hmm. Mm. And then yep. Duffy says Zoom does compression also, and you can't really post-process audio on a single channel source and compress yep. the audio and video. So uh, this is a question I, I've seen people talking about. Is it true that if you wanted to do this, you know, I, I don't have any game in the streaming competition horse or whatever, but is it, mm-hmm. I've heard people say that if you're doing this kind of style, that Skype works a lot better than a tool like Zoom. Does anyone have a strong opinion there or is it, um, cause sometimes I see some people doing remote, like on PC perspective, that looks like they're in the same room almost. And, you know, I don't know how much of that is post-processing or they just figured that out. Um, but I, then sometimes you hop what, into our calls and we're just a hot mess. <laughs> so I don't know what Jim's using now. Um, he's still using vMix for switching. Um, vMix is a, is a switching software. It's not OBS. So that's kind of where, uh, we deviate from the, the talk here. Um, mm-hmm. vMix, if you have the, the specific version of it, uh, it supports remote dialing. It does uh, IP, uh, what is it called? Uh, basically audio video over IP. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it works pretty well, but it, it's using a browser plugin and <laughs> you're going to hear this so many times. Uh, 
<clears throat> auto gain control is the devil. And if you can't turn auto gain control off, you're going to have a bad time. And the biggest issue with the vmix remote thing is that you can't turn off the auto gain control. Mm. Um, this is like if you, if you have someone in a meeting when they talk and it comes in really loud at the beginning and then it backs off, that's the auto gain control kicking in. Right. Um, right. There's there's settings in Windows and Mac OS where you can turn that off. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes the auto drivers won't let you turn them off, which is even oh, okay. Awesome. Yeah. So. Noise gating, especially on Zoom calls, is, is a problem. You know, any kind of background noise. If you don't have a noise gate, it's you're just going to get that flicker. You're just going to get that five frames, someone jumping up and going, oh. Yeah. Um, yeah. Skype. Um, Skype, if the network is reliable, works great. Um, the biggest issue we had at PC Per using the Skype setup was uh, getting the audio sync. Uh, we would have, we actually had a dedicated monitor off to the side on the switcher, which was running uh, IRC and then three Skype clients. And then on vMix, we set up, these are all 4K monitors. So we actually had Skype running four, uh, three 1080p Skype instances, which was so nice. Um, and then we took that screen and cut it in the corners on a capture board. And so we were actually capturing off the Skype client running on the second monitor. Mm -hmm. So that worked out really well. But in order to get the audio into our, we had a hardware mixer board. So the Skype audio was routed to these little PV USB to XLR um, DACs, which were then ran into the mixing board, which then ran all that stuff through the compressor chain and all that other stuff. Um, and it became pretty obvious that the, the additional round trip out to the audio board and back was just enough to be noticeable where the audio was lagging like three or four frames behind the video. And honestly, we just left it be. If you're not looking for it, it's really hard to notice. If you're looking for it, you'll notice it every time. Mm. So I, I have not found a mm. good solution for remote, remote video, honestly. Yeah, it does feel like the holy grail. I know that we've, you know, so, Joe and I have talked about yeah, doing that. Like and it's having just, just run Red Hat Summit, this week mm -hmm. sorry go ahead george oh no go ahead uh yeah having just run red hat summit this week we had you know multiple platforms that we were using and there was just nothing great so like blue jeans prime time was actually the the best thing that we found for workshops specifically um but uh you know a lot of our talks were done on another platform that was not as great of an experience and I won't name them just, you know, out of politeness. Yeah. Any kind of remote setting, it's, it, you're just going to be dealing with latency in the network and the network is never reliable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, All right. So in the notes next, we, we have the OBS settings here. And the, the first mm -hmm. thing you put is 1080p. Um, am I being bad for streaming at 1440 or whatever? Also, I've had people ask me, um, especially specifically on Macs, what the TLDR is on hardware encoding. Um, Cause that's an area I'm not familiar with. So if you could touch on that, uh, so that'd be fantastic. It, this is one of those things where you hear multiple views on this. Um, I'm in this, I'm a steadfast in the 1080p target camp. Um, most of your monitors are going to be at least 1080p. Most of your newer phones are capable of scaling it decently. Um, I think targeting 720p is a little bit outdated. Um, having said that, that other link that's in that article is freaking amazing. That's a wonderful link that's in that notes for setting things up. Um, yeah. One, one note on 720p, that is what Facebook is using right now for Facebook Live. They mm. cap it out at 720p. Yeah, and I feel like 720 yeah. but for a lot of us. everything else is 1080p or higher. Sorry, I, f I feel like between me and Chris's house, despite living only 20 miles apart, the, the audio is causing us, the delay is causing us to step on each other. Um, but a lot of us are doing terminals and things like that on the screen. And I think 720p, the presentation gets a little iffy there. If you're trying to do like, you know, your text editor or a terminal, um, you know, cranking up the video bit rate and the 1080p on that seems to be working for a lot of people. Yeah, there's, it's all trade-offs. 
you know, if you're, if you're talking like a live stream, you know, and you pull your bit rate down, you're going to have issues with blockiness on the terminal. Um, mm -hmm. You know, video compression is designed for video. It's, it's not designed to do screen sharing. It's, it's a mm -hmm. totally different use case. Um, so you either need to just crank the bit rate up and deal with it or, you know, do it in post. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, there's a definite gotcha there. Uh, anytime we would have remote viewers who are sharing a desktop, uh, if possible, have them record local because I can guarantee you that when they're sharing their screen and you have that little tiny text font, the network's going to blip out and you're just going to get mm -hmm. a garbled mess. And if you have that locally from them, they send you in post, um, just fix it in post, you know? <laughs> Those of us that, those of you who might have the option of fixing things in post, I don't really have a post mm. thing going on. And Ryan has a good point. Um, for as far as settings, uh, since you're not, yeah, if you're not 30. playing video games, 30 frames per second seems to be fine. Oh, that's plenty. I think is a good default. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, so for, that's Mac, for Mac people, how do they actually get in OBS the hardware? I, I want to make sure that uh, because on on a Windows or Linux machine, it literally just says you know you have an Intel QuickSync or you have an NVIDIA encoder mm. or whatever. That is something I do not know. D uh, D Duffy, I've, I think I've seen Duffy do this before. The drop down in so, Max and OBS should be <clears> the <throat> same, right? Uh, it is, but it's it's kind of buried. And to be honest mm. with you, I have an eGPU on this Mac, and like this Mac is a old MacBook Air, and I'm getting rid of it because it's just it's just pointless to try to do anything with it. Yeah, and I have. Uh, I actually have a dedicated streaming machine. So when I'm joining Zoom, I actually join with this account that I participate in. And then I do another account on a machine whose entire job is to do the stream because the whole kind of, you know, alt tabbing, looking stuff up in Google and all that kind of stuff while you are doing a stream is the machine will yeah. just sweat. <laughs> yep. Kill over. Yeah. yeah, so I actually, uh, I participate in the streams on this box, and then I stream on another box back here. Hmm. So generally speaking, I think there is no escape. A, a separate machine for most people, if, if they're going to be doing it on a regular, is probably should be on your... Yeah, um, if you can dedicate a capture and streaming device versus your presentation machine, do it. Yeah, down. and just one thing to know for everybody is if you're looking at an Intel NUC or one of those kind of like small um, PCs, uh, the feature you're looking for is called Quick Sync, and most, mo not all, but most Intel chips have it. Um, so make sure that if you're getting it, that that Quick Sync is supported, um, and you look that up because um, that will just offload the whole thing. Otherwise, it's churning it through software through the CPU, and that creates a, you know. A lot of fan noise I've noticed, um, unless it's in another room. Uh, so hopefully that will uh, that will be a good tip. I, I even prefer to always use the hardware encoding, even if I have my powerful machine. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so next here you have audio chains, if not in hardware, and then noise gates. Can you, can we talk a little bit on how to do this in OBS? I don't know if yeah. can you can you can you share your OBS? Uh, I don't know. We or is that, that on a before. separate machine, or if we could? We could talk uh, yeah. through it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. All right. Who wants, to, who wants to drive here? I'm going to share mine. I could share my. If you're going to walk through how to do it, I could. I have yeah. a. I have a brand new OBS. Yeah, go ahead, George. Uh, setup that I wanted to install so that we could start from scratch and not. Uh, not do that. So I will share this. That's not anything. Yeah, I'm, I'm streaming off my laptop today, and my my OBS installs over on my other machine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hear you. <laughs> Everyone's like, share your tips. I was like, actually, that's kind of hard. Um, let me share my screen here. And I know that at least in Kubernetes, we do we are making an effort and we are pushing our OBS configs into GitHub. So that is a thing mm -hmm. that I learned from Chris Nova and Jovita, which is a great idea. If you have a team of people that are going to be doing layouts and you want to share, does everybody see that? You should be, you should see my blank OBS. Oh, I can see yep. it. Thing here. Let me just remove yeah, we got all it. the old sources. Um, so go ahead, Alex. And All right. Just give me a quick TLDR on what a noise gate is again. So a noise gate, we were, we were talking about that earlier in the audio hardware side of things. Mm -hmm. uh, all a noise gate is, is once the input level drops below 
a threshold, it will decrease its volume even more. Okay. So once you get over the threshold, it'll let it right through. So like me talking opens the gate. When I'm not talking, it drops down and shuts everything off. So mm -hmm. there should be pretty much no audio coming from my signal when I'm not talking. And mm -hmm. you so can what do, do you do? Are you just throwing away everything under 20,000 hertz and everything above? Uh, you're, you're thinking of a low pass filter. That's okay. Different. All right. Okay. A, lo a low pass filter is when you cut out something below a certain threshold yeah. in a frequency. Okay. Um, this is strictly level. Okay. So it's, it's either on or off. And then you get, you know, the, this is the thing about audio gear is you can have two manufacturers with four different ways of telling things. Mm -hmm. um, like I know the compressor and the gate at PC per is an ACP unit. It has five controls for the inputs for its gates. Um, this thing I have right here, it has two. Guess what? None of the things are named the same. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but in software, it, it's a little bit more consistent. Uh, at least in OBS and Pulse Audio, they name them the same things, which is great. <laughs> That's good uh, to know. Yep. So what we're talking about here, if you go to your, your audio mixer and you click on the little control next to the mic input, this right here, oh, this gear? Yo. Okay. Yeah, this might actually not work for you because you're already recording, aren't you? Uh, no, I'm not streaming anything right now. No. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, just but I could turn this mic on like this. Oh, yeah. Now we can actually see what you're doing. Good deal. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's do it. So I click the gear. Yep. And then you go filters. to filters. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you're going to add a filter. So that's a plus. Mm-hmm. Oh, dope. Okay. I, I've never seen gate. this before. Okay. So noise gate. And I'm just call it noise gate. Yeah, I think you already have you already have a gate in your chain, don't you? On the hardware? No, no, I stopped. I, I wanted to do it in front of everyone instead of so I could learn it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't have a gate or anything at all on any of my audio. That's kind of why I wanted mm -hmm. I wanted to do this is to to learn those kind of tips. Right. So there's two things here. You have the open yeah, and close threshold. A, this is oh, good. Yeah, this is something that I think a lot of people are interested in. So let's talk. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a, this is pretty much set up the same way as the ACP is. There's the, the open and close thresholds, which are the levels. It'll open above a certain level, it'll close below a certain level. And those are in, uh, what, decibel, decibel below unity. So they're all negative numbers, so you got to think backwards. <laughs> okay. Um, I think on mine, I usually set gates around negative 30 to negative 25 is my and usual starting. I place. remember from high school, decibels are logarithmic, right? They are. So, so what's the noise difference between a 32 and a 26? Is that a lot? That's a lot. So okay. it's, a, it's a log scale and a, a three decibel. Oh, I'm so going to get so much rage on this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure on the terminology here, but a 3 dB change is twice the power. A 10 dB change is an order of magnitude, 10 times. And help me if I get this wrong, please. Um, my understanding is that a 10 decibel change in volume while being a 10x intensity in power is only heard as being twice as loud. I am 98% on that, but someone, I'm sure if I'm wrong on that, someone's going to point it out. Um, yeah. So yeah, a, a 10 dB change or a 12 dB change is a lot. Yeah, because really this is, is an 8 dB difference. So this is actually a lot. Is this a very large gate? Is that how you describe these? Uh, well, then you, you know, now you're talking terminology. It's like, how do you yeah, describe sorry. Okay, things? sorry. I, I didn't mean to do that. Um, <laughs> It's like, you know, just, hey, man, my car is making a funny sound. What kind of noise is it making? Is it making a yeah, scrape gotcha. or a shutter? A or weird what? one. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so what's the difference then between closed threshold and open threshold? So the open threshold would be what kicks it open. Okay. So you kind of got to give it a little bit of a punch to punch it open. And mm -hmm. then as it decays back, the closed threshold will, will kick in once it drops below back there. So you have a little bit of hysteries between the open and closed. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't, uh, Flat. Okay. 
and then you have the attack, hold, and release. These are the, the, the old school standard. You look at any kind of synthesizer, any kind of rack mount audio gear, they're going to have an attack, a hold, a release, and a sustain. And the attack is how fast it kicks in. So if you turn the attack time down, your, your gate opening is going to be a lot more abrupt. It's going mm. to go from nothing to everything real fast. Um, if you increase that, it'll, it'll be a little bit less aggressive. So that'll prevent things like a, a really hard, you can hear the gate slam open if you have a noisy background times. Mm. So you can kind of slow that attack down if you get a, if you get a punchy uh, cut in. So, uh, you know, it's attack times usually I, I keep those pretty low um, mm. because the, our background noise is generally pretty low. So you can, you can have it kick in pretty hard. Um, so how do I figure out what this is? This, this is just as simple as going with the defaults because it never is that simple. Or is it? Um, you just start, yeah, you just start playing it with suck. Okay, so I w- Okay, no, so I what, do you, what, do you, what do you have set, Chris, as for yours? Uh, I don't, right? And like, I was hoping to get that out of this because I know I oh, okay. need so, it desperately. Okay, so look at the, uh, you have your, don't, don't close it. Down the bottom there, okay. you have your audio mixer and yeah. you have your levels. Yep, I so see. So we were it. talking earlier about the green, yellow, red. Yep. That's pretty much the same thing. Now, I, right. I can't mm-hmm. see it on your screen, but I think it goes from green to yellow at what, negative 20? Yes, 30? that's minus 20. Minus 20. Okay. So as you can see, when you're talking, it's pumping at about negative 20, maybe negative 18, give or take. Uh, so what I would do, I would just put those right around the same area. You know, you're, you're open, sitting around 26. Um, I'd probably, you know, make that up to about 22 maybe. And then bring the, the clothes back up a little bit below it. Okay. And then just record and listen to yourself. This is something okay. where there's no right answer. Um, there is very much a, a feeling to this. Um, you just have to sit here and play with it. Um, so, but this will prevent me from, however, I'm talking and I still see the yellow spiking above the minus 20. Mm-hmm. So that's, gonna be so that's next- normal, right? Because there's like a, a roll off. Yep. Based on the attack time? I... Uh, well, now you're getting into the, uh, the instantaneous VU, and then you have the weighted average VU, and I honestly okay. don't know enough about that to give a proper Okay, so, so a good first step is get the open threshold to about where you want to be, mm-hmm. and then the close threshold, a few dB under yeah, it, call it call is it a good s- place to start. Six okay. to ten below it. Is a generally oh, a good six a good to ten. Time. Okay, all right. Um, so, difficult. question there. Mm-hmm. How? I'm gonna go. If you're checking in your settings and sharing with everyone, how do you manage this noise gate? Is this something that you're like, okay, pull on the new settings and then type in your numbers that you have saved? Right? Is that it like is, something that you would manage on your own independently? Yeah, G- gates are pretty much set them and forget them. Okay. W- once you get it set up, it's it's generally leave okay. alone. Um, so, so generally yeah, it, speaking, just by setting this, I've improved my audio quality with, uh, I yeah. think. So yeah, I mean, you, you could see okay. it right there where if you're not talking, there's no, nothing coming in. Right, right. Okay. So if you – now, just while we're talking about chains here, you generally you have uh, – you don't just run a gate. You also run a compressor. Ooh, we're going to do that. Okay, so I could just add – because I saw this earlier, yep. and I saw the stuff I hadn't – Ooh. Yeah, yeah. You want a compressor? Compressors are good. Okay. Yeah. It's a compressor ratio. Okay, a whole bunch of other numbers here. Oh yeah, this is the same thing. You so the what are we doing with, here? You have attack and release. Same kind of situation as with the gate. Uh, what a compressor does is it it'll increase the the lower uh, the quiet sections and it'll bring down the higher sections. Okay. So that threshold is where it kicks in. And that threshold is going to be a little bit higher than what your gate is because, you know, your gate's kicking in at negative 20. Then you want to start kind of backing things off eh, a couple dB above that. And, you know, when you're dealing with a hardware, one of these, you, you kind of plan a little bit different. So um, would you say below or above? Because these uh, numbers a little bit are above. negative. So is that above as in minus 21 or minus 18? Uh, what's your gate set to? 
20. Uh, I'd set your, yeah, 22. I'd set the compressor probably like negative, negative 18 or negative 16. Okay. Because your, so your gate's going to open up. Numbers, I think. Yeah. And then you're going to be linear from like negative 20 to, you know, 16 or 14 or so. And then your compressor is going to kick in. Okay. So this is not something you're really going to be doing on a live stream because you have to, you have to really push your inputs to, to kind of see sure. what's going on here. Um, but your, your threshold's where it starts. And your ratio is how much it takes out. Okay. So if you, if you have a, a threshold of negative 18 and a ratio of 10, 10 to 1, um, it will be less of a roll off than if you have it like 5 to 1 or reverse right. that, 20 to 1. Um, so, like on mine, uh, my scales are really messing with me. I'm sorry. It's like I'm totally confused <laughs> of mine. It totally makes sense now why my stereo receiver. The volume isn't just a percentage. It's always like a minus thing going in the opposite direction. So that's why yep. that is. Okay. Good yeah, to those, know. those are always yeah. values that are below max. Got you. Got you. Now let's see if I can actually do this with my compressor here. So mm. like if I take my compressor completely out, you know, I, I can I can talk here and it's 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 there's less presence to it, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of backed out a little bit. And this is me increasing my, this, this thing's called drive on this. I don't know why they call it drive, uh -huh. but even if I'm really quiet, it brings it up. Or if I'm really loud, it still keeps it pretty nominal. Right. Um, so that's what the whole thing of a compressor is. Right. So compressor is actually basically smushing the dynamic, the dynamic range. Um, yep. However, I, I, I know this, you know, from being like an audio person, I know that when, Audio is over compressed, however, mm -hmm. that leads to fatigue on the listener. So yep. how, like, obviously I'm not going to do this at like, you know, all the way over here or something like that. Right. Um, right. I, we, we actually might want to sidebar this and actually sure, go into sure. a more in-depth, we can make it in more in-depth video going into gates and compressors where we're not recording live audio off it and we can actually show you what's going on because you yeah have to yeah i think i think just it. knowing that this filters thing existed yeah, that would be um i think is a lot is a lot i get a lot of the um you know nothing against the obs yeah. people but i i do get a 1990s windows um, ui here i'm always finding stuff that like i was like i didn't even know that was like a button mm -hmm. um you know kind of kind of vibe so it's it's good to know to keep track of yeah. that stuff all right so am i showing more obs or are we moving on to what are we uh I can't see the Slack chat anymore when I'm sh when I'm sharing. So yeah, you can unshare. Hopefully... I think we, let's see here. We got the. It's, uh... it's pretty quiet right now. Okay. Yeah. We got what the what do people think about this? Is this useful for you or? Um... Oh. Um... Yeah. Like I, I would love more OBS to be honest with you. Yeah. The the one thing I did want to mention, uh, on audio chains, where, while we're talking about that kind of stuff. Okay. Um. Now, and these filters I'm doing here are only applying to my microphone here. Right. I have a separate one for desktop audio. Right. So if That's I was something... capturing, you know, other footage or something. A just... window. Yeah. Right. This is going to be a whole nother set of filters. Yep. Right. Now, th okay, got it. Th thank you, George, for segueing right into this because that's what I was going to talk about. Um, go into your desktop audio filters again. Okay. The, the, the blank one, you mean? Yep. Okay. And so I don't think this will be applying too much to people screaming through this, but if you're doing mm -hmm. audio on the desktop and you're streaming over it, yep. uh, there's something you need to know, so something called a side channel. Okay. So add a compressor again, or a gate, I should say. Oh, and you can't do this in OBS. Are you sure it wasn't in compressor? Because I saw something that said is line. There, is there a side chain in the compressor? Yeah, a side chain, a ducking source, whatever that. Yep, that's it. Sorry, it's not oh, the yeah. gate, it is the compressor. So what a okay. side chain is, a side chain is where you have an audio component that normally takes an input and an output, okay. and it does something to it. Like, in this case, a compressor is going to compress the audio from the input to the output. Normally, it does this based on the input. But with a side chain, you can give it a different input to drive the function okay. than the input. So if you take your, if you have a compressor running your desktop audio and you set your side chain to be the microphone, right? when you start talking, it will drown the audio on the desktop. So that'll stop all feedback. Well, it'll- Which is what you want though, right? Well, if you're sitting here like watching an intro video, you'll have full volume. 
but if you start talking, it'll duck the audio behind it while you're talking. Right. So this is how streamers can show okay. a full ge video game and you can hear the music and blah, 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 blah. But when they talk, you can still understand what they're talking about. Exactly. And it's not blasting, you know, the full. So, okay. So I need to get this figured out because this is something that I'm going to use all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That, I, I can see that being side useful. is amazing if you're doing any okay. kind of thing with, with audio on the desktop. That is good to know. Okay. I'm definitely said that. Uh, cause I'm going to start game streaming on the side as well to like learn more stuff at work. So I'm like, how, how do, how are people able to do, you know, games with shooting guns and stuff. And then when they're talking, they sound perfect. Yep. Um, so that's using the side chain ducking source. Yep. That is a side chain on a compressor. Okay. Good to know. Quick it's question. It's like programming, little modules that you stick together, yeah, yeah. together. Yeah, quick question. So we are doing yeah. this in software, but you know, I, I dabble around in a bass, and a bass player usually always has a compression pedal. Mm -hmm. um, is, is there a, and I've noticed that you're doing this in the software. Wouldn't it make sense to do it before you even get here? Or why not? Why aren't we doing this at the operating system level, for example? Or or in or is the or are we doing this in software because it's way cheaper than buying a bunch of stuff like you have? Um if if you can okay, so I had a Behringer unit that I really wanted to, and it wasn't a Behringer. It was a, uh, oh, what was it? it? There was a nice integrated unit that was external and had everything. It looked like it would be ready to rock and roll. Uh -huh. And it was the, uh, I took it off because every single review said it was terrible. Yeah, I took it off the list. Um, yeah, if you can do a hardware gate and compressor, it is so, so much preferable than doing it in software. Um, right. But you're looking, well, first you have to use a, a pro audio chain. You have to be on XLR. You have to have a preamp. You know, you're probably going to have some kind of rack to mount this thing in. Um, and you're going to be spending another 150 bucks. I mean, but yeah, it, I was just wondering it, if it's like a guitar where you could just keep adding effects pedals until you get the sound mm -hmm. you want. Yeah, you can chain them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, that's yeah. mine set up. I have a, you know, I still have the Fed head, even though mm -hmm. my, uh, this 286s is supposedly have enough. It, it's supposed to have enough gain to drive these things. Um, okay. Going back a little bit, we were talking about condensers versus dynamic mics. Um, mm -hmm. Some microphones are more sensitive than others. Like these Shures, notoriously low. Uh, these things are designed for rock vocals, but they sound so good. A lot of podcasters use them. But like this, and also the uh, the Heil. Uh, what are those PR forties also notoriously low. Um, you got to run a preamp on them, cloud lifter mm -hmm. or a uh, fed head. And that's, that'll give you 20, 20 to 26 DB of gain clean. Um, God, clean okay. gain is so hard to come by. <laughs> yeah. So um, anything else on gates and compress and what, what, what's this class of thing called? plugins like what are these um you'll you see a lot of people refer to them as vsts okay um plugins pedals modules yeah i, yeah, I definitely speaking of for hardware but you know you can do it in software too uh, yeah pulse audio supports this kind of stuff um i i've tried to do it in there but it just caused latency issues hmm, interesting all right Right after noise gates, we've had a lot of people asking about layouts and overlays and things like that. Mm -hmm. I, this is an area where I definitely want to improve. So is this a thing that allows all those cool graphics that people have on their streams? If you could talk about this a little bit. And I yeah. do want to talk about things like the rundown. Ah, the rundown, um, yes. Yeah, yes. and the rundown, because um, <laughs> I've seen people use that and I think it's really cool. Uh, to describe that for the audience, it's like when you watch your favorite thing on YouTube and they have a table of contents basically on the side where it tells you what they're going to talk yes. about so that you can fast forward and be like, okay, I don't care about this part, but I care about that part. And as they, they talk, this thing is going through. So you can kind of know where in the podcast you are. Mm -hmm. um, can sure. you talk a little bit about how you do that? And yeah. is anybody, I'm sorry, my kid's running all over the place speaking about noise gates. Um, oh. George, are, are, are you going to talk about your RTX stuff, George, while we're there? You know, you're talking about your at kids the very around? end. The very the, end? I'm saving it for the very end. I know yes. you're super giddy about that. <laughs> <laughs> but let's, let's talk layouts because that is, sure. is kind of cool. I love how people integrate text and things like that. Yeah. Um, now, so how does this so work? A little bit of disclaimer here. Uh, we 
at PC Bear, we did this in vMix. So this is not going to be a straight translation, but you can do this here. Mm -hmm. um, so the rundown, uh, the rundown is what we're talking about. Whatever you see uh, on the side or on the top or on the bottom, you know, what's coming up. Mm -hmm. um, that's, there's a couple ways to do that. Usually you'll take that and mask it. So you have some sort of source, you know, something to create the rundown. Uh, we right. used just a, a standard web page. It was literally HTML, body, div, or a unordered list, li, div, li, div, li, div. That's it. Yeah. The whole thing it was. Um, and then we used CSS classes to highlight it. You know? And then it uh, on key input, it would go to the next div and remove the classes and go forward. I mean, literally, it was less than 20 lines of code. Yeah, super, and I know Carlisi is asking for an example, and I am working on that now sure. here so I could show it to everybody. And uh, a lot of people do that. If they're doing it live, um, a lot of people won't show it live. Uh, we did it live because it was just easy enough to do it that way. Um, a lot of times it's just done in post. Yeah, let me just share this screen here. So what I'm talking about, this thing on the side here, where they talk about, so what they're talking about currently on the show is this in the green box. Mm -hmm. But as you fast forward, you can see what's coming up in the next segments of the show. Um, so if you have a long, like this, this, this show is like an hour and a half, right? And you're oh, like, oh, I, I don't want to I remember this, this episode. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, uh, oh, I'm interested in this thing over here. And you could basically fast forward. And this is especially useful on a TV um, because the TV will kind of give you a, a better thumbnail up, update refresh rate where yeah. I've gotten down to me on my TV. I can fast forward to exactly where I need to be on the show um, based on this like little sidebar thing. And I always thought this was some incredible magical thing, but you're telling me that this nope, is just, page. it's just a web page. Just a web page. And so, so what happens? Do you just add it as another element in, in your OBS um. that, well, we had it as, like I said, we were using VMAX, not OBS for this. Um, mm -hmm. So in, in OBS, you would do this. You would take your, your capture. You know, it would have your video capture input. Uh, that would be your base layer. And then you would have, oh, how are you going to do this? Uh, we were using NDI. Uh, NDI is from NewTek. Uh, OBS, VMAX, uh, it's a, I think it's open standard. My not. OBS has... As NDI inputs and outputs, I know there's a plugin for OBS, yeah. but I, I want to. I'm confused about NDI, and I was going to ask questions like that at the end. Yeah. Um, yeah. So NDI, um, that is, I forget the term for it. Um, so prior to NDI, there's something called SDI. Uh, SDI is an actual hardware interface which is used for video. Um, it's a professional format. Uh, it's pretty much an HDMI transport over uh, multi-link. Um, so what we were doing, we had a dedicated laptop running the NDI screen share utility. And this is all free stuff. You can get it from New Tech's website. Uh, it's the NDI toolkit. Um, and I think there's like a runtime library for Linux as well. Mm -hmm. So you would do a full screen capture on the NDI for the laptop that was running the browser, that was running the web page for the rundown. Uh, that was then shipped over to vMix through NDI as an input, which was then added as a second layer on top of the, this is where it gets weird between OBS and vMix because with vMix, you yeah. can set up layers on the output. And I don't know if you can do that with the scene switcher at OBS or not. You can. Uh, yeah, I, oh, you I can. think what I was okay. going to, yeah. what I was just going to try the, the HTML web widget so on the side, like yeah, I put the Slack chat, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can do that. So the way it works, uh, the layers work just basically in the order that the element is in, in that switcher deal. So if you want right. to overlay a web page on top of your video, it has to just be above that in the list. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and that, that point, another one of those 90s, not intuitive things that you just discover kind of deal. Yeah, this is one thing I definitely want to add to ours because I feel that yeah, it's more work, but the amount of usefulness that the user gets is just probably yeah. worth it. <laughs> it, it. It is so yeah. slick, and it looks so good when it comes out. It yeah. does. Yeah. Um, so, and yeah, you just mask it down. Uh, you can use a chroma key. Uh, we were actually talking about this a few days ago. You can do a chroma key on that, 
uh, where you, you punch out like a green screen kind of background. Uh, like our background on the, the web page was pink, so it was really easy to chrome it out. Um, the gotcha there is that if you ever if you have a blue screen in the browser, it's going to blue screen your entire screen <laughs> because mm, the chroma oh, okay. goes away. <laughs> Got you. Yeah, good to know. Got you. Hard and and you're talking. Yeah, and then we're, we were talking a little bit about overlays, and that gets us mm -hmm. into wipes and transitions and stuff. So in here, you say you could buy a good set of graphics on Fiverr for surprisingly cheap. So is this just one of those things where it was like, um, like I've thought about, well, I work, I have a design team. Can I ask them to make an overlay kind of thing? Like, like Chris? what do you search for? You just search for OBS overlay on Fiverr, and you just find something you like because all the ones i found are like super glitzy gamey like crazy ones right? yeah like <laughs> i haven't found like yeah, any like very nice subdued ones professional <laughs> ones yeah well if you're working for a company i would think your marketing department probably has a a standard standard kind of graphics cut for you guys don't you right yeah and i, I mean, suspect they do most... but they have no idea what twitch is right like yeah well no I, idea what OBS I suspect is. most of them are figuring this out now like hey wait right. a minute exactly you know like, we I should just have got this in is just as important with my creative team to do this right Right. All of a sudden, this is as important as your company's like PowerPoint template, right? Right. So, um, I, you could probably actually, you could probably get really far with just the PowerPoint template. Oh, I'm sure you could. Yeah, it's um, just like your I virtual you background, could. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah or you, you know, you, and you could do that with, um, you know, if your graphics department or your marketing department has transparent graphics, you can easily put that in as a layer. You know, just just your logo with transparency on it, a nice alpha channel, mm -hmm. um, with a nice alpha channel. Yeah. That's a key point there. <laughs> and then so, someone mentioned this. I'm going to leave it again because in this section, uh, there's a video here, and they say the first four minutes of this video for scene setup and creation is the TLDR. So yeah, that video. looks like it's going to be the go. Um, you say here sharing these layouts between teams. So this might be important for some people. Um, so screen and layouts can be exported as JSON files, but image and assets aren't exported. Use a well-known path to fix this like c colon backslash obs or slash serve slash op so yeah we always use op okay yeah that's interesting and anybody else have tips here i i know that for tgik we we the obs setup in um in github in the github repo um and then we've tried to do that for kubernetes but we had an issue where you know i was on linux and it had specific files that weren't working on jeff's mac and the other way around and we were just like Ugh, maybe it's right. taking screenshots is a better so, idea in this place so yeah the way the way we've done it with linux and mac users since that's our predominant use case we have like one scene where the linux stuff works and you just turn all those on and then we have a in that same scene, the exact same stuff for Mac users, where the they we just did it on the Mac because for whatever reason, when you open like a profile that was created in Linux, everything mm. is just like blank. You can't change anything. It's literally just like no description, close button. That's it. So we ended yeah. up creating a set of things for Linux to turn on and a set of things for Mac to turn on. Hmm. I imagine it would be the same way for Windows. To be honest with you. Yeah, and some some of the information you all are leaving in, or these you could just have really different cool. profiles of the exact same thing. We could run OBS in a container. <laughs> yeah. So uh, oh, speaking God. of the next section, I was going to say a lot of you are leaving with OBS really in a container. <laughs> That's a basic idea. Was it? Sorry, was I interrupting? Uh, the, no. the delay is killing me today, Chris. No, is your ahead. internet rabbits working? Um, my yeah, so this has got to be just shit right now. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty blocky. Yeah, so this next section, you're talking about uh, the plugins for OBS and stuff. And so the browser source is one that we've talked about that lets you just embed an HTML widget into your stream. That's mm -hmm. obviously useful. Um, and someone's mentioning this automatic scene sw switcher is dope. Regex powered. Um, who added that one? That, 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 that one looks interesting. Uh, let me just look at that one here. What does that even do? Yeah, it wasn't me who put that in there. Here it is. I'm gonna I'm gonna toss this in chat. Like I, I saw it, I read yeah. it, and I was like, I'm not sure what this does. Oh, it, I think it does automatic <laughs> scene cool. switching based on based on what? Spencer put it in. That's interesting. Spencer had to leave, so yeah. we, we'll definitely follow back up on this one. Um, but if he says it's dope, it's definitely worth. 
worth talking about here. And then I, I do want to mention something here as well. Uh, someone put in uh, managing or streaming keys. Uh, one, one of my pet peeves with OBS is, so I have to do multiple channels and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. And there's only one place for you to put your key. I can't have like my Kubernetes key, my VMware key, my personal key, and just toggle easily. I always have to do that. Does anyone have any tips there? Or is it just one of those things where uh, that's just what the tool gives us? I know, I know we do try to rotate uh, uh, streaming keys in the YouTube team for Kubernetes, for example, regularly. I, uh, um, Bob, Bob's got a good There's an there. option in OBS to yeah. go get the stream key. And then there's another, yeah. like another just method of just keeping them in your password save. Mm. Yeah. And I do. Whoa, I do. Rob, Bob's suggestion is brilliant. Yeah. That, just get yeah. Yeah. Just, just put it in Git. <laughs> like seriously, yeah. like nailed it. We're done. Yeah. yeah. Oh man, Git. Git fixes everything. All right. So uh, we were definitely going to check out this. And uh, someone put here nodecg.com, which looks interesting, which is related to the thing we were talking about, about doing Spencer, browser. I think that. Yeah, yeah he put that whole section broadcast. in. Yeah. We need to drag him on the next one and get him up on the There console. are so many good. So for the next one, here's what we're going to do. I think we're going to open this up to more of a, um, instead of us talking, more of like a discussion uh, that has many-to-many -many conversations as opposed to, Broadcasting. This is a thing that we just decided to put together. Um, the CNCF was like uh, moved really fast on this. We were like on Friday, we were like, we should figure this out. And uh, so I mostly wanted to use this to get the basics out of the way and doing that. Um, next, I, I do want to talk a little bit here. We, we're kind of starting to uh, run out of time here about Dude, studio we are, setup. We are right coming. on time, man. We, we started are 10 we? minutes late. We are right on time. Oh, okay. I, I, I missed that. Okay. Oh wow. yeah, we are. That's disturbing. Yeah, I got I got a big accurate. big marker here. Yeah. Plus ten. So minutes talk shift. talk back. So obviously for mm -hmm. a lot of us, right, we're engaging with the community. So this has yep. to be correct. Um, so in here we have Discord, we have Slack, we have Mumble. Um, well, there's there's two things there. there there's okay. talk back and there's community engagement. Okay. Um, talk back is explicitly one thing. Uh, talk back is a private channel for any kind of communication channel from oh. the technical director or producer or whoever's behind the camera to the talent. Oh, so this is the back, I've called this the back channel. Yeah, so back, back channel. channel. Okay, yep. got yeah. it, okay. So you can use Slack, you have a dedicated Slack channel. That can be kind of iffy if you're doing the whole sharing screen thing. Um, yep. We use Slack at PC Per. Um, that platform we used, uh, they didn't do production work, but they had a, a program in place there called Mumble. Uh, mm -hmm. which was amazing for this kind of stuff because you could key up with key, single key, like alt. Um, purely software-based, worked great. Uh, just something where you can have, you know, feedback off camera to your talent from behind the camera. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and mm -hmm. sometimes in the studio, if you're like three people in a studio, sometimes that's slapping their mics to mute and yelling at them. I, I've, yeah. I've cut channels before and, and said, hey, dude, you, you got something going on. I, I've frantically texted someone because in mm -hmm. the past we're like, okay, I'm going live. I'm closing down my Slack, closing down everything. And I realized that there was no way for me to get to her. Yep. So there was like an issue. And I remember texting her like, yep. Hey, your audio's too hot or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So definitely having a back channel or yeah. talk back. Um, yeah. But it's important there. Yeah. And, oh. You know, that doesn't really matter too much for the, the single seats or stuff like that, but it's more logistical. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and you, you have stuff in here like lighting. Uh, do we want to get into that at this point? Or... Um, lighting. You, need you can't have lighting. enough of it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. More light's better. Basically. Um, yeah. I, I don't like the about... panels. You know, okay. I, that's, personally, that's I don't like the panels, but... <sighs> I upset you by buying something without talking. Like no, Joe recommended no, release. He no. has two of these. No. Um, <laughs> so, those panels so are great um, talk to me like talk to me about panels so the, the issue I have with those panels is they are very discreet you know there's just a, a very tight amount of light um, if you have like six or seven or eight of them they work great 
Uh, if you have like two of them, can see the little LEDs there. Yeah, that's that's the thing with them. Mm -hmm. If you don't run the diffuser in front of it, you get these really weird, gritty shadows behind you, mm -hmm. um, which looks kind of cool, yeah. but it, it's distracting. Um, with the diffusers, it makes it a little bit better, but it's still kind of off. Um, I prefer to turn my ringer off. Um, I prefer soft boxes. The the bigger you know, you can run a panel and then run them in a soft box diffuser. Okay. Oh, those huge white box things. <laughs> yep. Mm. Oh, yeah. they look so much better. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm well, one of those. I know people. they look great, but like it would look yeah. ridiculous in my office. Uh, yeah, I think you have the same thing where it's like this is also my home office, so I'm trying to get the best bang for the buck without. Right. You know, yeah. having it, at that point, having a, then, those umbrellas with the light reflecting on them and stuff, and then you know, um, it's like, what have I done? Well, you can emulate that too. If you have, if you are using those light panels, flip them around. Okay. Face and that'll light. do a more ambient. Yeah, you can you can kind of kick them back. Like on this wall here, I have or like a, up or down or the shadow now. <laughs> um, yeah, I have one over here yeah, too. Yeah, there you go. So yeah. you can kind of reflect them off the wall. That helps a little bit. Um, but just just kind of get some space behind them. They it, it's so they can just get so weird in the lighting, especially if they make a really hard shadow. So mm. just and, things and to be aware thing, of. Yeah, one thing I learned, I got a light. And then I set it up and then it's like half my face. I realized that you need two in order to evenly, you either need two or you need to put it in a place. And this is something you have to think about everything from where you put your desk. And I was like, uh, this is starting to get really complicated. And then I set it up and then you told me just open two browser windows on my computer screens. And that was mm -hmm. the difference. Um, we're actually, I'm actually reusing. And if I close those, you can tell my, um, Oh, you know, my wow. face looks that, different, yeah. right? Because yeah. he just told me, he's like, do me a favor, open two huh. browser windows onto a blank screen. And I'm basically using my, my work monitors as like extra lights. And that wasn't obvious to me at all until I had him looking at me and then I would mess around. And he would tell me there, there, you look okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I kind of, I have a spare square light thing now that I think I'm going to end up using for probably lighting up my green screen but just mm -hmm. it wasn't obvious to me to consider not just the panels but the color of the thing that's displaying on your panel uh like if i had red wallpapers or whatever i would look red and i wasn't cognizant of that until you pointed it out and now i added to my little checklist you know you know make sure your face looks the right color or whatever that, based on that that's a, that's a good finishing topic here before we go to open q a yeah checklist use them mm -hmm. Checklists are wonderful. Um, I, when I was running it, I had a pre-flight checklist. I had a during the podcast checklist. And then I had a post mm -hmm. checklist. Um, because, you know, I'd leave, you know, leave cameras on for four days at a time. <laughs> right, right. Step seven, turn off all cameras. Well, I think. Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. The. The checklist uh, for me is like a killer thing because we often have it's like an intro video and then you have to like you turn on the actual like blue jeans or zoom or whatever you're using for that communication layer. You turn that on as desktop audio. So if you forget to do that, you're going to have this whole three, four, five minute whatever of just dead air because you forgot to unmute that desktop audio, which is the Zoom or Blue Jeans window. Yeah. And the checklist is also great, you know, if you ever need help or if, uh, I, I know we have rotating hosts on some of the shows that people are on where it's like, well, you know, it's so-and-so's turn, you know, to kind of host the show. Um, so having that shared checklist, I think. For TGIK, we have that in Git, in GitHub, um, where it's like, I am going to be the host this week and then we write it down and then every week or every once in a while, you're always constantly tweaking or adding a little thing uh, so that when someone is the next guest, they can at least start not from zero, um, mm. which, which I feel is, is really awesome. Um, yeah. And, and something I've realized over the years is that <clears throat> as soon as you turn the camera on, everyone's IQ drops by about 40 points. <laughs> 
Yes. I find including myself. your own. Yeah. I find myself. Everyone's totally... what? IQ? Yep. Yeah. I told my, uh, yeah. Man. Um, that's part of the reason why I do keep the separate box to do stuff because once I click streaming, I just know to not touch that keyboard and mouse. Whereas when I was doing it before, you're one alt tab away from like a disaster. Like mm -hmm. it feels like, you know, it's like, oh no, or, or whatever. Um, does well, anybody have any questions from the audience? We had a lot of people show up, but a lot of people also had to leave uh, once you get past the one hour threshold. Um, but we, it looks like we do have 22 people in the streaming channel now on Slack. So I feel like we're off to a good start. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to give people a few seconds there to go ahead and type. Um, George, we do uh, did in the Q&A from Chris. Oh, oh, here it is. Oh, the Q&A. Q &A. No, yeah, the Zoom button that says Q&A. I've been just answering the, uh, the questions as mm -hmm. I see them in chat. Um, Gemini is asking you, Chris, uh, sorry, sharing a link to, you. to your gear set up and wish list. Did Chris mention sharing a link? Yes, it is in the streaming channel. I can reshare it. Uh, Chris Hogue okay. uh, or Hodge uh, said, I was hoping to hear more about community content and promotion. When you have the, when you have the tech stuff dialed in, what's a good way to build a program? Well, I'll tell you that in like a month, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One thing I noticed is that like, it's definitely, been a learning experience for me like one of the thing, one of the tips someone told me was find your favorite youtube channel that you listen to regularly and go watch the very first video that they published um <laughs> and then you're like whoa uh so i kind of use that as my benchmark as to like okay you know i see they're improving little by little and the very first like you know just improving audio i think for most of us just adding these gates and compression and stuff should you know should pay good dividends um yeah yeah um yeah once we have the tech stuff dialed in so i i run a few shows i run one that's a panel um and then we ask we receive we do an office hour so we receive questions from the audience um and that pretty much the tldr i learned from that one um is delegating and assigning one person's in charge of the notes one person's in charge of uh, reading the questions, one person is in charge of gathering the questions, um, and then we're all ready to go. And as soon as we hit live, like we don't do any, <laughs> then we just kind of wing it. Um, but generally speaking, we do. But you know, it's like just one of those things where it's like repetition. I feel has been very good to me as far as the past two years, um, and then just kind of watching. I, hate, Alex, tell me if this is just a thing or anybody. I hate watching videos of myself. Like, but you have to do it in order to realize what you're doing. Um, I remember my first one, I thought I did it such a like great watching job. watching game film. Yeah, I, I, yeah, <laughs> I was like, I did such a great job because we answered all the people's questions. The panelists were awesome. They were talking, they were show, they were telling the audience all the kind of technical stuff I wanted them to tell. And I was so proud of this episode. And then I watched it on TV and I realized that if you were watching it, it was just me typing and copying and pasting questions to each other and the actual episode itself consumable was not awesome at all even though when i was doing it i felt the information that we got of it was good <laughs> but it just wasn't an entertaining you know it's like watching a basketball game and you know just showing you the coach the whole time like <laughs> it's like ah so that, that's something i've been um uh been doing been trying to um you know, get better at mm -hmm. is, is the content that we're producing actually useful for our community is, you know, and that's, I just watch it, you know, and I think of myself, if I didn't know what I was doing with the software, would this be good? Uh, Ryan's saying uh, we're on the CNCF staff. Uh, they're at their Slack limit, <laughs> which this was on the K Kubernetes Slack. You can definitely find me on the Kubernetes Slack, Ryan. Um, I hang out on the Sika Trebek channel. Just PM me. Yeah, and, same. Uh, we could def Yeah, a lot of us. There's a lot. There's a Venn diagram here, I think, of people who are on certain Slack. So we can definitely do that. Um, <laughs> do we miss anything uh, community-wise? I mean, you, we could probably have entire sessions on how to market your sessions, how to, yeah, you know, how to change up formats. <sighs> there's so much. Um, yeah. The, the only thing I took away from all those marketing discussions we had was be consistent, at least mm. on the YouTube side, just be consistent. 
you know consistently yes. produce your content yeah same which which mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. do you all uh, i, I want to address this real quick before we totally run out of time here um analytics so in youtube i get flooded about the amount of people that have joined my channel and things like that uh does anybody have any tips or tricks to share because i feel like i'm always constantly watching so when i'm on youtube and someone else is hosting i'm always watching the analytics um and you know in my brain i'm like well if a lot of people are bailing then you know we kind of need to either pick up the pace here or do something or if like you start strong i I notice in our office hours they start weak but then they get stronger the longer you're on i think that's as people are saying and realizing that the show is on that kind of thing Uh, does anybody have any recommendations here or any kind of so I got some tips from Spencer uh, last week or the week before, um, basically saying that Twitch's algorithm like starts showing you love around the two and a half hour mark. So that's a very long stream. Okay. Um, and then, you know, the shorter sessions on YouTube, uh, you know, they'll start off strong. And if you have an active kind of audience that is tweeting, like you're asking them to tweet and chat kind of deal, it'll pick up real quick. Mm-hmm. Um, but the the stuff you have to do beforehand is, you know, like on Twitch, you have to have it in the schedule, you know, same thing for like a website. If you have, you know, a YouTube thing, you got to have everything laid out and scheduled and, you know, you want uh, as much uh, notice as possible for any session. Yeah. Like, I think yeah, CNCF, and then Bob said, you know, Kim's on the call. I think CNCF does a fantastic job. Yeah, and then Bob says Twitch is tailored for extended gaming sessions, right? So two and a half hours makes kind of sense that they would optimize for that. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience? So I, I think definitely this this is off to a good start. I think what we'll do is we'll keep the we'll keep the uh, Slack channel going. One thing I definitely want to do is also so we've talked a lot first. I'm looking forward to not talking, and perhaps having all right, Spencer, your turn to share your expertise. You know, and then they get, you know, to do the session like that. And then, you know, I'd, I'd love to see how Carlicia sets up her show, how Duffy sets up his show, that kind of thing. And I think that would really help us as far as I've as got a person that. too that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that'll just help keep the ball rolling. Um, so I'm, I really appreciate everyone that showed up today. We've got tons of notes here uh, that I think will take me a long time to consume. So <laughs> this has already been useful for me. Um, yeah. Uh, but before we go, Alex, do you have any closing thoughts? This is like your first time hanging out with the cloud native folks. Kim, look, you looks like you had a good time. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you know, yeah, okay. the same way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, closing remarks. I mean, yeah, uh, um, we've all been there. You know, we've all had yeah. show zero. We've all had session zero. Um, this is this is a learning experience. This is going to be outside the comfort zone. Yeah, um, definitely. And mistakes are going to be made that happens laugh about it move on yeah and i'd just like to thank everyone for showing up um i know a lot of you have experience doing this so just having you showing up is also awesome um and that's it for us chris so what's you wanna, your plan what's your plan on? going forward there boys so i think what we're gonna do is hang out in the hash streaming so channel okay um get yeah. stuff i think we're definitely gonna start um, posting follow-ups here. I'd like to get feedback from people. Uh, let's get people a day or two, I think, to consume some stuff. It's going to take me like two days to go through this document. Um, but okay. I, I, th- I, I get the feeling that we're yeah. definitely doing this again. What, what do you all think there um, in chat? If you can give us yeah, some more feedback. Definitely. Yeah, I think, I think giving people more feedback, or more time to give us feedback, especially those that weren't able to attend. Um, Stacy says, yes, please. Uh, Lisa, Marie has to bounce. Yeah, for sure. So, and you want to set that up so people can talk, so you can have interactive. Yeah, like a normal normal Zoom thing. I don't Preferably. know. Preferably. Normal yeah. human conversation. Yeah, I don't know if we want right. to set up like a recurring meeting once per month. No. Might be no, useful. It's up to you. Whatever, whatever you all decide, you, do, you know where to find me. Yeah, yeah. And I, I figured just CNCF okay. hosting a streaming channel, I think will go a long way towards helping us share our expertise. So thanks for that, yeah. the people that made that happen. All right, Chris, outro us. Thanks, and everyone. we are, um, we did record and Christy's going to get this up on YouTube. So awesome. uh, she'll send Sweet. you, a- Alex, Chris, and George the link, and then you all can share it however you want. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. Thanks, wonderful. everybody. Great. Thanks all for joining us for this wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Alex and George. 
uh, Kim getting this together. Thank you, everyone, Christy. Uh, that's all the time we have today. Uh, thank you for joining us. The webinar, the recording, the slides, everything, uh, you know, not the slides, uh, the notes um, will be available online. We'll be in the streaming channel on CNCF, and we hope to see you again in a future CNCF webinar. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye, y'all.